What's up, everybody? My name's Dom Palumbi. Welcome to our fourth episode of our Domcast series, where I interview fellow musician friends, streamers, and of all sorts. Uh, I am very uh, stoked to have my good friend, Mr. Jeremy Hunter of Ska2 Network, joining me today. Jeremy, how's it going, man? It's it's wonderful to have you here, part of the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on once again. No problem, man. Uh, I, like I said before, and I believe for the, some people that may not know, the first time that we actually got to meet was because of our experience together at MAGFest. MAGFest, for people that may uh, maybe do not know, I believe is one of the biggest video game music-focused conventions uh, probably in the world, you could probably say, but known to mostly the United States. And we actually played a gig together with uh, my good friend Max Boyko, who's the trumpet uh, player for this band, Video Game Music Collective, VGM Collective. And that was the first time we actually got the chance to meet. Um, you know, And you were playing trombone that day, if I remember correctly, uh, mm -hmm. outside of n now all the instruments that I know you can play <laughs> and, and all that sort of stuff. It, I, it's funny to me, uh, you know, y we meet so many different people in our lifetime uh, and so many different people nowadays can play so many different instruments. I'm actually very curious to know, like, what is your main instrument and, like, what procured for you to kind of get started with uh, playing more than one instrument? Or how did it kind of start for you when you were uh, growing up as a kid? So my first instrument was trumpet. So I've been playing brass longer than anything else. But um, I always had issues. I struggled with trumpet. It's just a harder instrument for me to play. And in ninth grade, my band director said that I should switch to low brass, uh, mainly because they needed low brass. We had so many trumpet players and barely any low brass. Um, and so I switched to trombone. And that had been, that's basically been my main instrument since then. I later learned the problem definitely was not the fact that I just couldn't play trumpet well, but it's just that I had like an, a sax player who was like my middle school band director. So like he was very good at teaching woodwinds, but like lacked in like that, you know, that brass knowledge. Cause now that I've actually talked to real trumpet players and gotten information from them, I've gotten way better at trumpet and just overall brass playing. So, uh, but yeah, I was just that band kid that would pick up every instrument and try to play things like at football games. And then hey. I eventually started just, playing everything so you were one of those those uh marching band nerds and pretty much did you know everything imaginable that was music oriented while you were in school i would probably say too so did you do like jazz band did you do even like uh uh you know whatever else that was a part of your programs at the time i, I don't know exactly how your school program was run yeah ours was very marching band heavy so definitely it was like you couldn't be in concert band without being in marching band we had jazz band, but after after like my sophomore year, he stopped doing jazz band because we just didn't have like the resources to do it, which really sucked. Um, and what else did I do? We had like the end of the year concerts, which were like really really big. Like if anyone's familiar with Blast, it was based off of that. That's like the Broadway marching band on like stage production it's really really dope it's hard to find videos of but if you see any of it it's like really 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 dope stuff uh, we did that at the end of the year and that was always like optional you had like a minimum you could do and i was always in like eight numbers playing different instruments right man actually blast i i remember i used to watch a bunch of the videos or at least like they had like two or three videos on youtube uh back mm -hmm. in the day um and, and this was when i was like starting to play drums when i was like two or three years in in if i recall i didn't know you were a part of that man I, or i didn't even know that they're still a thing technically speaking right now uh, yeah well they are, are in japan but like when my, when i was in high school we had people who worked on blast and we did like a high school blast knockoff version um i was i was actually going to audition to do blast this summer so glad i didn't <laughs> like put all the efforts and get my hopes up to oh, do man. that yeah, I could. Uh, but yeah, like when I mar I also marched drum corps, so all the people I marched with or the people who taught me, they're all blast people as well. So, dang, that's actually really fascinating for especially for me. I actually didn't do marching band when I was in high school. I'm one of those people, unfortunately. But I always had an appreciation for anybody that decided to go through the core core route um, because I feel like mm -hmm. that kind of music or that kind of intensity with regards of the 
prerequisites or the things that they make you do there, it really forces you to get all your stuff together. I'm curious to know, like, how much of an impact impact that was for you, uh, you know, getting your fundamentals together or like, you know, talk to me about your experience when you first heard about drum corps or or marching band in general. And, you know, what, what was what was it like for you after uh, all and said all was said and done? Um, it definitely has uh, impacted my life as a musician and just as a person in general. It really teaches you like how to be disciplined really teaches you how to do the boring the boring work for a long time. Like a regular drum corps day is you wake up at 8 a.m., 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. is breakfast, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. is PT, physical training, and then 10 a.m. to like 1 p.m. is morning block where you're probably doing visual or music, and then 1 to 2 is lunch, 2 to 6 is rehearsal, 6 to 7 is dinner, 7 to 10 is rehearsal, 10 to 12 is snack slash get ready to sleep, and you do that every day, pretty much all summer. Uh, so it's definitely like when you do that and like you're spending four hours of that day just playing like one note and making that note sound really good, uh, you 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 get you get disciplined. You get real disciplined where like anything seems easy. Like I'll work on a cover and it's like, oh, it's only three hours because I'm I've spent three hours playing one note before. Working on a whole song for three hours or whatever is like that's nothing. So it's definitely that, but also I was fortunate enough where, where I marched at Blue Coats. They're a group that teaches, like, their philosophy as a brass staff is we want every member to leave with the ability to get a gig on their instrument. A lot of drum corps, not a lot, not anymore, but, like, back 10 years ago especially, a lot of drum corps teach you how to play loud. Like, that was their thing. They, they don't care about tone. They don't care about style. Just play loud. And Blue Coats was not one of those corps. And now, like, going into, like, how drum corps is now a lot of chords are moving away from the let's teach let, let's stop teaching how to play loud and let's start teaching how to be good musicians so definitely had a great brass staff teaching me uh it helped develop my tone to get a nice dark dark warm sound that i like on my instrument because a lot of trombone players especially have a bright very very bright sound i know for me especially like <laughs> it's it's so funny because like i respect anybody that decides to go through that route it's so it feels like such a rigorous process or i guess like when you go through it it's not so bad were, was there a point uh during through all that where you were like having any second thoughts or uh were, were you enjoying every single moment uh through throughout the whole time that you spent through all the core stuff um for the most part i i i had a great time i didn't really have any big second doubts a lot of people they call that hitting the wall where like you'll talk to someone and they're just like i'm hitting my wall right now like why am i here why yeah. did i make this life decision i mean there are days that suck where it's just like raining like my the last i, I marched two years and the last year i marched uh there was a day where it was like 45 degrees and like drizzling so it wasn't like hard rain but it was like enough where you were damp all day and it's like June, it's like June, but it's 45 degrees because Ohio is like that. Wow. And it's like days like that where like your 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 feet are just wet all day. You're just like, why am I why am I here? It's like winter. That's crazy, man. That's that's like that's I mean like that's like I don't want to say it's like pushing the limits, but you know you risk getting sick uh, potentially in that weather too. And it's like I bet you, oh, yeah. I bet you can't take any sick days off or or anything like that or. If if they if yeah, they give you any, mm -hmm. no, if go it gets ahead. too bad, then like obviously you can't rehearse. But typically, it's very proactive. Or if you feel like you're getting sick, like they they give you medicine or like they you always take the steps to like avoid getting sick. I never got sick while marching, thankfully, because out of two years of marching and one year of teaching, I taught a whole summer in eighteen, so I had never gotten like sick. Actually, I don't even think I even got remotely sick. I was pretty healthy when I marched. Dang, man. Dang. Uh, did you actually, like, um, it, what was it like when, when you were, like, marching around the drum line or that sense? Were there moments where they were, like, about to break your ears from how loud they were playing? Or were there were there moments where you were just like, oh, this is, like, the best thing ever? I bet it's, I bet it's like that wild ride, like a, any roller coaster that you probably go on or, or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, no, there was, there was never really a moment where anything was too loud, but I've also been going to punk shows since I was, like, in 10th grade. So I feel like if I had any sensitive hearing, it was destroyed by a really loud amp at a punk show before <laughs> it was from, like, a marching band. 
man but yeah no it's definitely like an experience especially with like i have a gopro video on my youtube channel of a rehearsal like running through our show and sometimes i look at it and i'm like oh yeah people we were just running around we were really doing that like you'll see people will like run under the prop and then like people are like scrambling and grabbing other things and like people are switching instruments and guard is like grabbing rifles and like just it's just like chaos the whole time that's amazing man yeah i i i think back and i'm like you know i probably could have gotten some good things out of out of doing that stuff and of course i think there's there's good in anything uh and especially like at least from what i hear you really i believe took the most out of your experience uh for the mm -hmm. couple of years that you spent there you know now since you mentioned like punk stuff i'm curious to know like what really was the first thing that kickstarted music for you in general outside of playing trombone and doing all the things in, in, in music school, what was like the first thing that actually really got you into music? That's an interesting question. Cause I've never really thought specifically, like what was the thing that got me into music as a whole? I always enjoyed music. Um, growing up in general, my parents, especially my dad played a lot of music. Um, he played a lot of like jazz and stuff like that. My brother played a lot of hip hop. My sister played a lot of like R and B. So I had a pretty well-rounded, like, understanding of a lot of music growing up. But from coming from, like, TV, which is, like, in case you couldn't tell by, like, my entire branding, as well as, like, all the covers I do, I really love cartoons and, like, animation. So, like, growing up, that was always influential to me. And I guess as a kid, I was, like, no one listens to, like, music from, like, TV shows. Like, that's just not a thing. And now that I'm older, I'm, like, no, that's totally a thing. I dig that. Like, yeah. like who cares what people think? Like, listen to what you like. And a lot of punk music and alternative rock was like a huge thing on TV from the time I was growing up, like in the early 2000s. So I'm pretty sure that's like the thing that got me into music the way I am now. I went to a, a show that was also an anime convention. It was the wildest thing in the world. I was, I was in ninth grade. And yeah, it, was, it was basically an anime convention that had a stage. It was almost kind of like Mag yeah, in a way. yeah, yeah. Like a really, like a really baby Mag. Now that I'm like thinking back on it, I'm like, yeah, this was sounds like a baby mag fest in a way in miami um and that was like my introduction to like a lot of like alternative music as well as like music involved in nerd culture so that was like probably the thing that like set me off into this direction that i am in today well it's funny if you, i guess i wonder if you ever thought back to yourself of like man i didn't expect that like all this uh you know stuff that influenced you as a kid we're really kind of come back. I mean, like, you know, today's day and age, people are bringing back stuff from the 90s, from, the, you know, vinyls making a, a return uh, more than mm -hmm. ever. You know, the old stuff is coming back. Uh, I, I wonder if that was, like, something that you kind of realized once you got out of high school or when you when you went to – you went to college for music, if I, re if I recall correctly, too, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I'd be curious to – like yeah the 90s stuff is like the coolest stuff like i think of uh fairly odd parents or spongebob or you know the tv shows that you you and i uh, uh, ha, uh relate with from being born in our, our years uh, i'd be curious to know now it's like with all of that being said okay you got into music through you know having sort of a musical family you have now all this background and playing a couple different brass instruments what was like the direction that uh like you started to even check out punk music stuff too uh how did like uh your your i th ideas or thoughts for Scott to network to start to become what it is today or what was like what were, what were you going through in your head when you kind of like started to piecemeal all that stuff together Scott to network was such a fluke of a project. I don't even know if fluke is the right word. It was not meant to ever be a thing and it just became a thing. Like yeah. we were talking about that yesterday. It's right. like, I feel like most viewers kind of just start doing the thing and then people like it and they keep going. Uh, that's the story. Yeah. I mean, I used to make other videos. I remember the acapella app was a huge thing in like 2014 to 15. Like people were always making videos like playing trumpet, trombone, whatever, multi-tracking. And it was iPhone only. And I only had an Android at the time. So I was like, I can't, can't multi-track sure. but i have a camera so i can multi-track and edit in premiere because i am also certified in premiere i got a certification in high school so i'm pretty i know how to use that program pretty inside and out most of the time until it starts not working in my favor then i have no idea why um uh, but 
but yeah, so I started editing the videos myself and for like a year and a half, uh, mostly through 2015, I would put these videos on Facebook. Most of them I have turned into full Scott covers at this point, like me playing Euphonium 20 times, but it's Lost Woods from Legend of Zelda or, or it's just stuff. Like, it was a lot of video game covers. Like I did a few Legend of Zelda songs, um, stuff here and there. And then I got an interface. And the reason I got an interface and I got logic, like actual recording equipment is because I was studying to create music for like TV shows and movies and video games at the time. And one of my friends was developing a pilot. So I was like, oh, I should, I should find a way to like, you know, make that music. I started learning what commercial music is at the time too. Like when you watch a TV show, it's one person who just creates the music on logic they don't you know they don't like send out parts to an orchestra like that's not how tv works especially that's not how video games work right the money's not there you have to be proactive create it yourself type stuff so i started diving into that and then with the new resources i had i realized i could create ska covers and ska demos which is like cool i can demo out demo out songs even if they sound terrible like for myself and so just to like start learning i started covering songs that i liked and eventually i made videos to them and put them on like facebook and three videos in a row on Facebook got like about half a million views. So I was like, oh, I think this is a thing people like. Back, back then it was easy on now on Facebook to get half a million views is really hard because the algorithm destroys you. But like 2016 was like probably the prime time for Facebook when it was like huge, but the algorithm wasn't killing artists yet. Yeah. At least not as bad as it is now. What, so. Was Facebook the first thing you started posting to, or was there other, uh, was there other like, did you start posting on YouTube before Facebook, or was did you so focus Facebook on was first? It was on my personal Facebook. I didn't make a Facebook page until after the YouTube was already at like twenty thousand subscribers. But fa- the my Facebook was first, and then I got like a thousand friend requests, and I was like, all right, this can't continue like this. Uh, so then I made the YouTube channel like shortly after and started posting on YouTube. And then I started posting on like both my personal Facebook and YouTube. And after a few months where I was like, okay, this is like a thing that people like, I just changed all of my social medias to Scott to network, like my Twitter. So I didn't make a new Twitter. I just changed my Twitter handle and my Instagram to that. Cause I was like, I already have like 4,000 followers that I've built up over time on each of these. And like, just to get up to like, like that 5,000 mark, I feel like it's so hard. Cause like I've even made new Instagrams and stuff. And just getting to 100 on that, I'm like, why is it so hard to get to 100? But once you get up to, like, 5,000, like, since I've gotten, I feel like people see the number, like, the 10,000 followers, and they're more inclined to hit follow because they see a lot of followers. Because I've noticed the rates only getting faster for me, despite, like, analytics saying I'm reaching the same amount of people. That's that's really funny how much numbers can have such an, an effect at this point, especially with today's day and age of, like, social media being such a driving thing oh everybody wants to kind of reach these different number peaks i guess from what i can tell it you didn't seem to have like that kind of mentality when you were just getting into it you were doing it because you enjoyed putting out those videos it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a a second thought for you uh or something Mm -hmm. I'd, i'd be curious to know like how was it for you going through the process of maintaining that discipline uh posting videos so consistently and just keeping you know keeping yourself uh you know in, in uh s- relatively sane through all of that or making sure you're constantly enjoying yourself from posting all those videos i think a thing that's very that works for scott to network that a lot of other youtubers i feel like don't achieve or people just do covers in general because a lot of people who do covers aren't on youtube um but don't achieve is a lot of people will try to do covers to do like what's popular. And I just do covers cause I want to. And it's always been that way. Whenever I do a cover, it's, I never like, I've never done a cover where it's like, I don't want to do this, but I know it'll pop off. So let me do this. I just do covers. Cause you know, like who else is covering these? Like really, really like who else is covering Magilla gorilla, the old cartoon network bumper song, wow. you know, like that's, no, one, that's no one in the in mind has, I'm gonna have what to, happened? I'm a, that's a throwback. I'm going to have to re-look that up just to see if I remember that show. I just, I just posted it yesterday, actually. It was, I, I did like a reggae cover of it. I just, because I'm doing a Cartoon Network cover record. And I was like, oh yeah, this is a this is a throwback that like most people won't know. But for those who know, they'll be like, this is dope. Yeah. And so I feel like that's kind of always been the vibe of Scott to Network. When you look at my like archive, it's like, yeah, I have a Billie Eilish cover. I have like a Blink, a few Blink-182 covers. But when you really look at like, every cover i've done it's i'm hitting i'm hitting covers that no one would expect 
mainly because one, I want to do them. And I like, I, I hear the song as a ska song, but two, those, you know, those market, like, there's people who want to hear this stuff and it's definitely a lot less than the general consensus. But then again, these small amounts of people who want to hear it, they're the ones who are really like supporting me to the point where like, you know, my Patreon as well. And so I think numbers, I feel like people will focus too much on numbers and they let like the numbers and what will make them big. I feel like those are like that, that stuff just gets in the way. And I feel like Insane in the Rain music, you know, Carlos is another YouTuber where from what I've seen, I feel like he just does stuff because he feels like it'll be cool. And like his followings, like, oh, you should do this. And then he does it type thing. Like we did that cover of uh, Steam Gardens. I was talking to him, like, if you have anything in mind, I'm down to do whatever. And he's like, well, my following wants to do this. And I don't, I have, I just can't figure out how to make a cover of it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I can definitely hear that as like a surfy ska song. So yeah. like, you know, people are probably covering like a lot of songs in from the Super Mario Odyssey soundtrack before they hit Steam Gardens. But like people were asking for it and I heard it. So, and I liked it. So we made that cover. And I feel like youtubers like that are definitely the ones that they find the success because they're doing it for themselves and for the people who care rather than trying to do it to be famous and i think that's a and that goes for anything in life beyond youtube just do it do it because you love it and i think everything will naturally work out yeah i i I try to remind myself of that so much and it's like i it's funny now of how many friends i have that are being really successful in the social media grind especially between you between carlos between you know pat bartley too or the j music ensemble or you know uh adam neely if we really want to you know go somebody that's been doing it for so long what what do you think outside of that has been the biggest ticket for you have you carried over things that were from your drum corps experience that you've taken and utilized the same techniques from uh from you know your work on social media or is there something that you feel like you learned along the way um from making so much content nowadays where you're posting you know to almost four different platforms almost every day uh with the with the amount of stuff you create Mm -hmm. i think one of the biggest things i learned from drum corps believe it or not is performance now the performance aspect of it and kind of taking it from like a live performance into an internet persona performance type thing where in drum corps like the, the objective is you're a person on a football field several tens of yards away from the people in the stance. So if you're not emoting, if you're not performing, the people who are sitting up in the nosebleeds aren't going to be able to see your face. They're not going to be able to see what you're doing. So you have to kind of like overperform. And I feel like that's something that has definitely transitioned over into my videos whenever I make like the faces and like the big body movements. Like all of that is because I had to do that for two years when I was marching drum corps in order to get the point across all the way to the back of the stands in the st- in the stadium. But not only that, but just the the idea of the emotion, the emoting and the performing beyond that into like the social media. I look at a lot of social media for some people and like only post on their Twitter, like new cover on YouTube and the link. And then like, you don't see anything in between. And I think it's very important as, as a content creator to, you know, show that you're a human and like talk to your following. And I, I see a lot of bands, especially like going back to the world of punk, there's a lot of bands who don't ever associate with their following or they act like they're too cool to associate with their following. Or like, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but they kind of create this like, well, I'm in a band, you listen to my music. Like, why would I talk to you? That's like, that, that's like the vibe that I get. And to yeah. me, it's like, yeah, I create music. I create covers, but like, I'm a person, like you're a person, like, this person I idolize is a person like everybody's just a person doing their thing. So I, and I think it's, I think it's dope. Like I love it whenever bands that I look up to and artists I look up to are just chill human beings. So that's just something I always aspire to be. And that's another thing in the drum core world is like being like no one in the drum core world is this ethereal next level being, you know, like there's no one in the world of drum core. That's like, you know, that, that person's like a drum core all-star. Like that kind of doesn't exist. You have to like teach a group for like 30 years to become a drum corps all-star, I guess. And even that is like, yeah, you know, it's just like Matt Harloff from Carolina Crown. He's just a band director at a school at the end of the day right. who teaches or like, you know, like Derek Gibson from Blue Coats. Like, yeah, he's won several championships under different groups and has a, a credible horn lines under his belt. But at the end of the day, you know, he's just a guy from the UK who teaches band like, and I think there's like a, that the humblingness of drum corps in that aspect where it's like even the biggest drum corps people 
no one knows who they are outside of drum corps. So I guess it's that inclusiveness of the community and the humbling of the community. And I guess carrying that over as alongside with punk, because punk is that way too. It's like, you can be in the biggest punk band and go on the street and the regular person won't know who the hell you are. So there's a, there's definitely a humblingness that comes with that. And I think it's important for artists to not have these huge egos and be assholes about it. Yeah. I feel that especially too, with like, you know, not hanging, you know, a a specific status over your head too, or like knowing the fact that you have, you know, a massive following or something like that. Like, I respect you so much because you're just a straight up nice guy. Just like, as you were already saying, you know, uh, I think it, it goes to show if you can gel with somebody and everybody's a person, you, you can, you can at least find something that we find together in common. You know, you, you there's no reason why two people can't have a, you know, a, a solid conversation or build a relationship regardless of, where they're coming from or where their background is in that sense. So I, I, I respect that so much of you. And it's like, it's cool to hear um, just like another person's viewpoint on just where they're at in their lives. Cause we're all like, you know, building our own paths uh, for, you know, creating our own success and that stuff. Um, I'd be curious to know like a little bit more about like, so you've been focusing more on punk and ska uh, music as of late. Uh, what kind of kickstarted uh, this more ska music, punk f- music focused for you uh as it, whether if it was just like you know going through the motions or what was something along the lines that like really like man i could play this music for the rest of my life if that's something you're trying to do i think it was a lot of a lot of being involved with music and this is something that i really loved magfest for and i really loved that community uh for is that when i was younger I found I found like the local punk music. I found people were like booking punk shows and having shows in like backyards and like warehouses, like pretty much, especially in South Florida, wherever you can find a place to have a show, the show will be there. And like everyone was really friendly and supportive of each other. And that was like a community that I had never experienced before. And like I didn't really find in other things like um, a community that is so supportive and wanting to build up their their own build up their own platform because they don't have like, you know, the platform in any other way. And it's like, especially like in South Florida and all across America, like venues and live music venues get shut down. And on top of that, it's harder for punk shows because like, even though most punk shows is just people standing still while a band plays music, the idea is like, you know, punks will just destroy my venue. Like, no, you can't play here. That's like been a huge struggle in Florida for people booking shows. So uh, just to have a community that supports each other and wants to create uh, something great out of what they have. And that reminded me of MAGFest, because, like, you know, at MAGFest, all the musicians just supported each other. You know, it's just a network of people who are all supportive and having that community. So that's, like, what kind of drove me into, like, the punk world and into, like, the ska world. And the ska world specifically was, you know, when you play, like, trumpet, when you play trombone, when you play saxophone, you either play in, like, a marching band or, like, a symphonic band or you play jazz and there's not like a, there's not much else for you out there. So to see like this world of music that I love that use the instruments that I play and seeing people like with a trombone, like jumping around stage, like crowd surfing while playing trombone. I'm like, okay, that's like a cool alternative that they don't teach you in school yeah. about what you can do with the horn. So that was definitely a thing that like drew me in for sure. Dude. I've only been to actually so many punk shows growing up as a kid. I guess it's just funny to me. Cause like, I had a lot of friends through high school that kind of went through that phase. I bet, I bet you like, did you actually go through like the battle of the bands kind of phase through high school or did you play in a, play in a group at the time that, that did something like that? Was there, was there... I had, a, I had a band in high school, but sadly during our existence, there was never not one battle of the bands. Rip Arena, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. There were so many before we formed. And then I, I guess the time we formed, there just wasn't any, my school is also new. My freshman year was the second year it was open. So a lot of stuff was like getting figured out at the time. I see. Yeah, I actually never really. I had actually one opportunity to probably join a punk band, but it's so funny to me. Like the way I normally play, or you know, the way you see me play at this point, it's so jazz drummer focused <laughs> that it's like having such a punk feel is is a totally different style of playing. And I'm curious to know, like, from maybe some of the other drummers you've worked with, what are some qualities that you find like? when you're finding other musicians for this specific style of music that you look for, or what are, what are some things that like, 
you think about when you're focusing more along the lines of this style to get things like I don't want to say correct in a sense, but um, right. Uh, I think the biggest thing I look for is uh, versatility as a musician. I think the coolest thing that a musician can bring to the table is different perspective. I can write ska music like it's nobody's business. I can, I'm not a great drummer, but I can play ska drums pretty great. Um, it's just a feel thing. But if you ask me to play like jazz, I can do like the, the ride cymbal swung feel yeah. and I can like comp a bit on like the snare and kick, but I'm not amazing. I can't, I can't play a gig. That's something for sure. I can't do, you know, <laughs> I, can't, I can hold my own as a Scott drummer for a gig pretty well, but for anything else on drums at, at a gig, no, I, I probably maybe like a, a like a rock band with like a sixth grader playing some ACDC. I might be able to do like a little boots, got boots, got like just keep that going in the background, but but no. Nah, so so I think the most important thing I, I try to focus less on are you like a ska musician and more on like are you versatile enough? Can you offer like a perspective or another like idea that I couldn't figure out and create that? I think that's when the coolest music is created. There's a band called really from, they all went to Berkeley school of music and they all studied jazz in some way. Like I know the trumpet player uh, studied jazz. He actually plays trumpet in Scott two network as well. He was at MAGFest. Um, the guitarist studied classical guitar uh, the keyboard player and singer did music therapy. The drummer did jazz drums and they play like in an indie rock emo band, but they also sound like a jazz band. And it's yeah. like such a cool mix. I've never found another band that sounds like them. Uh, and it's because they have all of these different perspectives and then they're creating a type of music that sounds nothing like their area of study. So I think that's when stuff gets really cool. And I think that's when stuff gets really weird. I like when music gets weird. I think with people experiment more and that's why i like mixing punk with like not punk so much because punk is a whole nother world that it's difficult in its own regard and it's like like you said it's a whole different style and a lot of people in the jazz world i feel like look at punk and they're just like oh that's just like punk or whatever yeah but like i mean it's a whole type of music and i think there's a lot of versatility to it i think there's a lot of dope musicianship to it and that's something that i've always been curious to see like what type of creations can be mixed with like all of the styles of punk there are and all of the styles of jazz. So yeah, if you're ever getting into that, let me know. I can send some stuff to you as well. Dude, There's a yeah. lot of dope. Yeah. To be honest, you know, for me, it's something that like every time I watch one of your covers, it makes me think, man, it's such a different style altogether. It's just, it's just a different, like uh, it's, it's almost its own different world because you have to kind of insert yourself and say, okay, you know, how, how can one kind of manipulate their way and their self, uh, their waves through it? When somebody like actually has requested some of your videos on my stream, I'm like sitting there thinking, okay, what is going through this guy's head? How is this drum part, you know, working? Cause you have the drum parts like going all over the place too. Um, which I think is like the most fascinating thing. Maybe it's just because I'm a drummer, but, uh, it's, it's, right. I think that's the kind of the most unique thing about your approach of like, writing or some of these covers or something like that i'm curious to know like how much research did you do with regards of the ska punk music uh as your background so it gave the how so you that information helped you cur curate what you uh did or talk to me about like some of your biggest inspirations in those styles or in those uh, uh genres of music that kind of given you more of a, a source of direction a lot of the inspiration comes from going to live shows and seeing bands like a million times uh florida is just a great place for music in general i, th I think it's it doesn't get enough appreciation as like a music a live music state especially like miami orlando gets a lot of live shows even north florida like jacksonville like gainesville is like a punk capital of the world that people don't like realize um but just seeing so many bands play and like whenever i'm seeing a band play like I'm like vibing to the music, but there's always like moments where I'm just like looking, like what is the drummer doing? Like, what is the guitarist doing? Like, how is their stuff fitting in? Like, sometimes I'll listen to a song a million times and then I'll see the band live and like, like all right, I always hear this song and I never understand what the guitarist is doing based off of what I'm hearing. So like, let me see. And just a lot of studying stuff live is a huge inspiration of that. Florida has like the 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 world of music that I grew up in is kind of like this like emo indie scene. That's very like prog rock driven. I think I talked about that with you a little bit yesterday. Mm -hmm. When it comes to like drums, like 
a lot of the drummers I look up to, they're like, they kind of drum in this like math rock, prog rock type way, which is why like you'll be listening to my covers and then you'll hear this like 16th note double bass like drum fill type thing going on. Yeah. And I think it's just cool. I think it's a cool mix and it's a cool fit. As far as like ska goes, I definitely look a lot back into like the roots of ska, you know, ska is a, a Jamaican genre. Its roots are from like Calypso and Minto, which is like uh, Jamaican folk music. So there's a lot of Afro, like Afro-Caribbean like rhythms that coincide with the ska music. And there's like specific rhythms that fit super well. So it's almost like a puzzle, like seeing like, okay, like, well, this rhythm fits well because of this. This rhythm fits well because of this. How can we mix them together? How can we get this vibe to work? And that's another cool thing about creating covers is sometimes I do things in covers and I'm like, will this work? I don't know. And but it's a lot of experimentation. It's it's ways of being able to experiment, mixing styles and getting weird with things and seeing what works and what doesn't. So now I have like more stuff under my belt. So like almost it's almost like doing it is a way of learning in its own right. But then there's also like a lot of bands I listen to, like again, like I said, like older traditional ska bands where I'll sit down and I will more or less transcribe the drum parts. I'll transcribe the guitar parts. I won't write them out, but I'll like sit there and I'll be like, all right, I noticed the snare is hitting on like two and the and of three, like all the time. It's creating this like this rhythm and like I'll sit down and I'll figure it out. So there is a lot of sitting down and and just I mean, it's the same way jazz players do it. They just transcribe it. They figure it out by ear. So I guess I do the same thing. I figure it out by ear. Yeah. No, it's like, you know, it's cool to see how you go about trying to put things together, at least like. From my understanding, you're taking a lot of resources from those that came before you, so you can try to curate all that stuff and and find your own sound and and figure out you know what works or what doesn't. The 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 fact of doing it too is also like sometimes it's easier said than done. The tra- the challenge of making those things happen or taking the time, spending it, and and like dissecting every single minuscule you know part, whether it's the drum part or the guitar part or the bass part or the trombone part for that matter it's just like trying to figure out that i'm actually curious to know like what was the weirdest uh what was the weirdest thing you've you've covered or what was the weirdest musical experience you've had since you're so into this weird zone oh on a cover um that is such an interesting question i'm actually gonna have to pull up my youtube because i can't (laughs) even think just like so many things come to mind but i feel like there's one that is just so out there that oh gosh um oh you know it was kind of a weird one i did carol of the bells for christmas and that one was weird one it's in three four which scott normally is never in three and like every time i've covered a song that's in like a triple meter versus a duple i would make it into a swing so like you know i would just swing in the triple like the that 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 i like put the the upstroke on the third beat or something like that but that one i just straight up kept in three like uh no problems that was a weird one also megalovania was kind of a weird one too because and i mean you drummed to that one and you were like what's going on <laughs> we put that for magfest and that one too learning like the rehearsing that was like what is happening because that song just doesn't have a structure like like it has the opening riff the bop, 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 and then the whole middle that structure makes no sense and then it goes back into the riff. So yeah. like that, that was a weird one for sure as well. That song is pretty much just like a loop and then it has like a verse, a chorus and then it goes back to the loop. It's like it's yeah. it's not even like a full song you potentially could say. I guess it's just because like most video game tunes you find nowadays are loopable or like you know they can be replayed at, they, uh, you, they can be replayed over and over and over again. So, you know, I bet for that, for you, you had to kind of get creative with how can you end the song or how can you figure out, you know, what's the most efficient way to make this weird situation work uh, in that sense. Man, I don't I actually think I missed that um, missed that part of the performance on on uh, at MAGFest. So I'll have to make sure I check out that video or, or something along those lines. That's that's fascinating, though. I'd be curious to like kind of go in a direction now like you've been making covers for you know quite a quite a long time at this point you also compose a lot of music on your own time too uh talk to me mm-hmm. a little bit about maybe like 
some of your favorite things that you've written or, you know, what are some uh, techniques that you've discovered through using your covers to help uh, create some of your own music for other people or, you know, you do a lot of other side work from my understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a lot of composition that I do is it ends up sounding like video game music. That was never the intention to begin with, but I'm also okay with that because I like video game music and people who are commissioning me like it. So it works out, but yeah, like my dream before the whole world of punk before wanting to become a commercial musician, I used to want to play trombone in an orchestra. That was like the thing I wanted to do. I wanted to get my orchestral chops super high. Um, and I wanted to, I had no interest in like writing music. I had no interest like really in playing jazz or anything else, but like, just, just give me that Arvin's book. Let me, let me shed in a music building for four years and then let me join an orchestra. That was what I wanted to do. And then I got into writing music. And then as I started writing more, like in early, like college years, I was like, huh, I kind of don't care to ever play trombone live ever again. So then the script flipped. I was like, I don't even care about playing live music. I just want to write it. Wow. And then gig started coming up. I started playing in bands and then started getting asked to play more stuff. And then I did drum corps. So now, now to me, like I still kind of don't care. Like I'm not actively like trying to become a live performing trombone player. I'll do it if someone asks and if someone's willing to pay, especially like, yeah, like when you're a freelance musician, you just take work when you can get it type thing. But, um, but composition has always been the forefront for me, even above the ska. The ska stuff just happened, so that worked out. But I've uh, since then, I've just been curating my compositions. And the cool thing about Scott to Network is I'm also learning how to mix. Uh, I have friends that are all engineers, and they, they teach me things like, you should do this. And some of them are like, you know, there's theories to how to mix. Some people like to, some people like to do not touch the faders at all and do all of the dynamic stuff through the eq some people like doing all the dynamics through compression there's so many different ways to do it and i'm not the greatest mixer engineer in the world like lord no i am not but i'm learning a lot just by doing the covers so whenever i go back to my orchestral compositions i have that knowledge with me and they just they just sound better and a lot of that is like i guess another thing is like as i'm learning all these covers especially like video game songs I'm learning these songs inside and out, and then I'm seeing the 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 choices that these original writers had made when they're composing. So then I like use that back on my advantage. Like I was working on um, a, a song from Sonic. I'm working actually. Pat from J Music is playing alto on that, so that's going to be a a fun cover. But just just learning that the chords of that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I've known this song my entire life, and I've known it pretty well but i never realized the cool chord stuff that was going on in this song so now it's like that's like another cool chord idea that i have under my belt for when i for when i decide to write music and i'm like looking for a certain vibe it's like i guess it's just getting all these cool ideas under my belt uh from transcribing these songs when i do the covers more than anything i think i think that helps the most dang man you know and i think that's the coolest part is like for any artists out there i bet you know there are some people that really struggle with trying to find you know all the different techniques possible to really discover their own voice or like you know to really find uh what are some efficient ways to get started with composing i'm curious to know like you know what kick-started you with just writing your first couple tunes or what was like the first bits of inspiration outside of ska and punk music stuff like how did like you know what maybe what was the first experience like when you wrote your first piece of music actually so the first thing I composed actually was in high school and it was a concert band March. There's a few things I composed before that, but none of them were like fully finished, like hit, send, export, finished forever. I just, they're just unfinished pieces that I've eventually recycled parts of, but I wrote like a concert band March. I printed it. It never got played, which sucks, but oh, I was like trying to find my band director said we could play it, but then that year became a mess because he had to go to like court as a on jury duty for like three months and oh like boy. our band didn't do anything for three months because <laughs> he was gone uh yeah it was it was a while but we were supposed to play it that year we never did um but that was a huge inspiration off of joe hisashi or, or who does the music for uh for like miyazaki movies that was actually like the thing like miyazaki movies and hearing that music and seeing the effect the music has on those movies because those music those movies are masterpieces like i love those movies so much the more I watch them, the more I learn about them, the more I love those movies. But 
something I that's definitely true is if you take the music out of those movies, the impact won't be as hard. It'll still be impactful because the writing is incredible, but the music is what makes those movies legendary, in my opinion. So like seeing the power of music and like what can be done with like an orchestral music made me go, oh, I want to write music and compose like for the rest of my life. So that was the thing that definitely did it. And for a while, I was definitely just... I don't know if you can hear my roommate's cat going crazy right now. <laughs> just just um, barely. Nothing too crazy. That's so funny. Uh, but so I don't know. I don't know if I don't know like what had happened, but I just had like a, a two year long writer's block. And <laughs> I had a two years long writer's block where I just couldn't write anything. And the thing that actually got me back into writing was 8 bit music theory. I started watching that. Go, I found that channel binged it all and then i started it was cool seeing music theory kind of explained through that lens i feel like a lot of the time especially going through music i feel like music school actually is what burned me out because you know you're learning all of this stuff about like the classical era i got all the way through music theory four and stuff and like learning about like you know all like the secondary dominance and neapolitan chords which is just a tritone substitution and all this stuff in there. I don't know. It's just like, oh, these are the rules. This is how it has to be done. You can't do it any other way. Right. And then seeing a bit theory kind of break things down, like, yeah, the people who made the music for Mario just didn't know how to make music. You know, they learned along the way. Because I'm pretty sure they were like programmers originally making music for like the original like Nintendo games. And they kind of just figured things out. And like, you know, like a bit music theory, just like breaking down these things and saying, well, I don't know if these were intentional or not. I feel like that's like the most used phrase he said in his videos. I don't know if the compo like Koji Kondo made this intentional or not, but this is what is happening um, type thing. And like, it's true. It's like at the end of the day, like no, no one told Bach what he was doing. He just did it. And then later on people, uh, people took a analysis to it and realized that, Hey, Bach and Vivaldi and and Haydn, they were all doing the same thing probably because there's a theory behind why music works the way it does. Um, and so with the approach of music like that and seeing how Nintendo especially has mixed together so many different styles of music, like jazz, like jazz fusion, especially so much jazz fusion in, in video game music, I'm mixing out like orchestral music and like pop music in so many ways. And just seeing how like this, there really is no limit on how you can like create music and mix music together and stuff like that is what kind of what drove me back into composing and seeing 8-bit music theory like analyze all that and and tell me concepts that I've known my whole life but didn't know there was a word for like type things like just seeing all that explained got me back into writing and inspiring me a lot it's in the last like three years or so Dude, it's funny. Also, if you haven't seen the if you haven't seen the third episode of the Domcast, we interviewed uh, Ape It Music Theory. So make sure you go watch that. <laughs> make sure you go watch that episode, because <laughs> it's so funny that this is being canon after after that episode. Um, man, it, you bring up a really good point too. You can't necessarily read somebody else's intention. Uh, I mean, like you could read you know a classical composer's intention on a sheet of music but you know th there also is things that you probably can't necessarily get out of just looking at a at a page with lines and dots and little expressive you know dynamic markings and accents and uh, you know time changes if that's if that's the case i think the most fascinating thing is you know every composer imaginable is going to have their own reasoning and sometimes people are kind of left in the dark without without knowing that reasoning of how it is because like you were saying they were just doing they were just trying it out and you know it's what they came up with in that moment in time i'm curious to know now of like how much that has affected you uh, uh with that kind of thinking process or you know have has your viewpoints kind of changed uh over the past couple of years after doing it for you know so long at this point yeah, it's it's my, my viewpoints have definitely changed. The way I compose now is so different than the way I used to compose. And covering music has definitely changed a lot of that too. Um, within the last three or four years, I've really gotten into more or realized that I love pop music and catchy music. That's just the thing that I, I love. I love listening to a song that has a good hook. Uh, I love a song that gets stuck in my head. That's just what I love. And when I compose orchestral stuff or like video game music, I kind of go for that same thing. I used to always come up with like a really wild chord progression, like all these crazy, like parallel, like 
chords and stuff like that, whatever, like borrowing chords from the parallel keys and all that. And now for me, it's like the opposite. I come up with like a really catchy melody or a melody that sounds really good. And then I like accompany the chords. So like mm. the way I write music has completely flipped over onto its head throughout the last few years, just through experimenting and trying things out. And sometimes I'll even challenge myself. Sometimes I'll, I'll pull up, uh, I'll open my DAW and I'll assign like six instruments and I'll, I'll say, I'm going to create a piece and not, and not leave the restrictions of this. Like all I have is like drums, like a, I don't know, like a bongo drum or something like that, something random and like, like a piano, a flute, a, a guitar. You know, it's like not not the most conventional setup, but it's like, that's what I have to work with. Let's see what I can create out of that. And I feel like creating these limitations, when you create limitations, you get the most, you get the most genuine results. And I, that's something I've noticed uh, throughout all of the times of me writing stuff. And a part of that is I don't have a drummer, like my drums are all MIDI. And so MIDI drums sound completely different than real drums. And I think because I use so much MIDI drums sometimes, it, it shapes the way the cover goes because it's like, I want to do this one thing, but the limitations of the drums I'm using doesn't allow it. So I have to find a way to work around it. And then I start doing other things that sound, actually, I like sound better than my original idea. And it only works because of the drums I'm using. So, and like, I just got a new drum plugin. I just bought Superior Drummer 3, which is like really, really good. It, it's, I spent a week downloading like 700 gigs of <laughs> drum samples. So it's really in depth. Um, and a lot, but just the changing of what drum plugin I'm using and like how I'm doing covers now has completely changed. Dang. Like the way I record guitar parts sounds so different. So, so I think the the limitations of of what you have and creating your own limitations and just forcing myself out of my comfort zone is how I create the most interesting sounding music. Seven hundred gigs, man. If any if any musician had seven hundred gigs, man, we'd be set for life. No, I'm kidding. It's a terrible joke. <laughs> uh no man that's that's actually like i hope it's not actually 700 gigs on your hard drive because if you have to get like your own separate hard drive just for that boy that's that must be like overdrive on your computer or or, or something along those lines i just i never heard a yeah. program have that much data but like you know that it's must probably not gigs but i know i have an external hard drive that or an, i have two hard drives in this computer and one of them is is already full. Like I just got this computer, like refer or re like restarted, or whatever. And um, one of the hard drives is already full with music samples. I also got like new Native Instruments stuff, like all orchestral samples. Oh wow! So I, I didn't see the number of them all separately, but all together, it's like almost a, like a terabyte of samples. So wow. So it, the the I know the drum one because the drum one took a week to download. It was one of the sample like packs was a hundred gigs of like the six. So they all weren't the same size, but I'm pretty sure it was up there a couple hundred gigs of drum samples. Wow. Kind of going back on the uh, limitation thing, I, I know for me especially, I think I find myself in a similar situation where if I set limitations for myself, whether if I'm practicing a specific pattern or trying to work on a specific concept to unlock creativity, what was uh, what do you think has been like, your most uh, effective way outside of like, you know, maybe what was like your weirdest configuration of uh, things that you have written for, uh, or what was a pro what was a project that you did for somebody else that had like some really really out of the out of the box or not out of the box, um, outside of your comfort zone uh, requirements uh, that really made you had to think differently. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So one time this person had hit me up, they never used the song. So now it's just on my reel as an example of a thing I can come. It's like it's one of my favorite pieces I've ever written, actually. Um, it sucks that it never got used, but someone had hit me up saying that they're making a reel for like their, their film stuff and they want something cinematic just in the background. And I was like, okay, it's cinematic. I can do something like that. So I created like this piece was like strings, horns, stuff just i don't know something you'd see in a movie trailer something super generic and then they were like oh this is nothing like what i wanted i was like okay well you said cinematic uh can i get more example then since like i don't know what you mean by that right and so they sent me they sent me like a playlist of songs that all sounded like very perks of perks of being a wallflower like that like late 2000s like rom-com dramatic teenage 
drama like movie like sounding music hmm. that's like what they sent me i was like okay this sounds i want to say this sounds cinematic but like i see what he's saying it does remind me of movies so <laughs> i guess cinematic so it was a uh, basically me writing guitar like as if i'm writing like indie rock from the 2000s but accompanying it by an orchestra and that was an interesting piece because i've never i've never written a song with like I've never written a song that's such crossing genres like that in a way where like the guitar part is like just straight up like it's someone 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 said it sounds like Blink One Eighty Two and I can't unhear it. I'm like, damn, this really does sound like a Blink One Eighty Two song, oh, but with like a <laughs> and like he wanted like big drum. He he kept sending me back notes with it. Like I'll send it and he's like, oh, can you get like big drums in the background? I'm like, all right. So you want like these like big Tycho drums behind this like. Blink 182 guitar part with like strings in the background with piano with like heavy delay and like reverb that's like and 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 it never got used. There's so much work and love went into that piece, but one day I'll sell it. It's it's up there. It's available. Um that's the but that I think that's the coolest part that I appreciate about anybody where it's like, you know, some people maybe don't get to experience the the time and the effort that you put into trying to make somebody's vision uh somebody else's vision what it is and you know there's so many i feel like there's a significant amount of people or artists that are out there that put in so much time and effort into a work that doesn't get to be used so it's like it's always mm -hmm. fascinating to see like what was that out of out of the blue if you weren't doing music what would what would you think you'd be doing if you if you had you know if music wasn't your thing Oh, if music wasn't my thing, I'd be doing one of two things right now. I would be studying art to go into animation. Actually, one of three things, because uh, I thought about this a lot before. I would be studying art to go into animation, uh, which I feel like I would have gotten discouraged by that because that's such a competitive field and there's so many talented people out there. I would have been doing uh, probably TV production stuff. Like I said, I was in TV production in high school. I'm a certified in Adobe Premiere. Probably would have gone into editing that's a market I actually have a lot of friends and who do that work. And I feel like I would have very easily found some work editing or working for like a, I don't know, like a realty company, shooting drone footage, something like that. Probably something in that vein. Or the third thing, I probably actually would have ended up back on YouTube, but I would have probably gone to college for nutrition. And I would have gotten into heavily into nutrition and veganism specifically because that's something I definitely like, even like three years ago, I was super into like nutrition and I, I've had, always had the idea of creating like a, a ska record that talks about like nutrition and, and health science. Cause that's something I love. I love science. So the science field, I feel like if I ever went into academia, it would definitely, academia would definitely be into science, specifically into health science. Cause like ana anatomy was my shit in high school. I loved biology in college. I loved taking health sciences and anatomy in college. So something I love. Dude, I, I feel the same way. It's just like, I was always so fascinated with science stuff growing up, or I was like probably more wanting to be an engineer. Uh, I actually have been more inspired lately with like the winter, winter Gatan stuff. If you've seen like his huge marble machine uh, where mm -hmm. he actually has been building this huge machine that actually like uh, specifically drops marbles on, on instruments. So uh, to create music or almost like, the anim the the old anime music videos. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those that were like animated uh, music where it was you know instruments all over the place. But uh, somebody animated uh, like a video of like balls being dropped perfectly. Yeah. It's it's like that's like old video back in the day. And some of those like were the jam. Um, it, it's funny to me that where I think about like you know it's amazing uh, sometimes uh, how these outside influences that have no relationship to music whatsoever still can kind of relate to that uh, along those lines so i find it very fascinating that you're like so into science would you like ever or have you ever considered trying to like okay with your ska like nutrition thing or you know is has there been uh influences in those avenues that would influence your composing along those lines or have you have you tried dabbling with some of that stuff yet Ooh, that'd be, I have not dabbled too deeply into that, but that could be interesting in a, in a lot of its own ways. Um, I am very much a composer and I know that based off of how I write things just in general. Like I make like choices when I write, like, oh, if I'm going to be making a song about the, the earth getting hotter because of global warming or something, 
the song will probably be faster or something like that. Like just little little composition choices that the average person would not pick up on for whatever reason, but like would like I've been work. This is a little a little off of that realm, but I've been working on uh, like a fake video game soundtrack. That's Ooh. what I've been posting on Twitter the last few days. And I'm like creating like an ice level theme, a desert level, like a, a water level and things like that. And for like the ice level, all the instruments that are taking the melodies is like metal instruments, like flute, uh, vibraphone, stuff like that. Because like metal is colder than like when I'm doing like the water level themes, uh, the water level is a lot more, um, a lot more flowing instruments like a lot of strings because like strings flow like water like like compositional choices like that i feel like that's something like no one's ever going to listen to that and be like ah yes yes you're using a flute because a flute is a metal instrument and metal instruments are cool like i don't think any person ever listening will say that but like that's just like a like i like i make compositional choices like that all the time and i feel like if i'm ever creating music based off of like science or something like that there'd probably be compositional choices not necessarily as like, oh, yes, trumpet reminds me of the world getting warmer because of global warming. But like some way, in some facet, I'll probably I'll probably influence the writing style of the songs based off of whatever topic I'm talking about. So that's actually very interesting. I want to think about that now. I'm going to throw this idea out there. Somebody was recommending in chat, Skav, Bill Nye, the science guy theme. Uh, that th- I'm just putting it out there. Maybe that's something we should consider doing. I think that'd be fun, to be quite Ooh, honest. that'd be real- because, hey, you know, uh, I, I actually have that as an alert on my stream. If somebody donates like $5 or 500 bits, that goes off and I play along to it. And that brings back so much nostalgia uh, just being as a kid. Because, like, I feel like there's so many people that watch that show back in their young days or back when they were in, like, third or fourth grade. And, and some people, okay, maybe some people don't know about Bill Nye the Science Guy at this point. Um, yeah. But – it's just like it's it's another one of those things that I feel like would work really well with the way you present yourself with all of this nostalgic music that brings people back to eras back in their childhood. Even my mom was actually just saying one of the cartoons you were covering for was back on her her childhood days. Actually, yeah. funny enough. So that's super super funny, man. Um, man, and I guess like what uh, what, you play so many different instruments at this point. Do do you have a main instrument? That you that you consider, or do you kind of just you know flex them all at this point <laughs> with regards of your versatility? Oh no, no, definitely trombone is my main instrument. Um, trombone has been the one that I, it's definitely my main. It's the one I'm the best at. That or euphonium, because I'm a, I'm a valve person over slide. Slide to me is still like it's not foreign anymore. It was foreign like two years ago for me still, but now now I can think about slide positions no problem and play. But like. Whenever I pick up a euphonium, I'm just like, wow, I can play valve so much better than slide. I hate it. Like, I mean, part of it is that you can just play runs on valve. Like, I can actually go really fast. I just can't, physically not that possible on trombone. Um, And if it is, like, possible, then you're, like, Joe Alessi. Like, you know, like, one of the greatest trombone players in the world. Yeah. Type thing. Um, But I've been practicing trumpet a lot recently and guitar. Those have been my two. I'm trying to get, like, the curve, like, I'm trying to get it real flattened out. You know, I'm not, I'm trying to like make it seem like I'm equally proficient on everything. Saxophone right now is my weakest one because it's the newest one. And it's also the only reed instrument that I can play. Like I can play multiple brass. I can play multiple percussion. I can play multiple string instruments. And I've been playing all of those other families since high school, but I picked up saxophone basically when Scotch Network started. Mm. So so that one's definitely a weak one. There are things about saxophone that to me just make a lot of sense. Like I think the instrument is laid out really well and makes a lot of sense. It's just things happen like a, like a squeak and I'm like, I don't know why this is happening. Like no one's taught me how to play saxophone. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of being held back for that regard. But um, once, once this pandemic is over, I plan on getting with one of my friends who plays sax and all woodwinds and hopefully she can, she can help guide me. Also, I think my sax is broken. Um, I that's another thing about saxophone that's like really annoying. Based on, versus like brass, where like if something on brass is broken, it's one of like two things that you check and then it's good. But for sax, it's like a pad could be go- like need replacing, right? And it could mess up the whole instrument, and you think you suck, but then you realize it's the pad. Because one time I had a saxophone that was terrible. I thought I sucked and then I got a better saxophone and I was, I sounded great. And I was like, Oh, 
So it was the instrument the whole time. It was not me. Yeah. It's a shame sometimes uh, how gear can really, like, I guess, like, drop the qualities of, like, when you're trying to get the most out of it and the instrument just doesn't really perform for you or it just, like, it doesn't live up to your set of standards. Uh, with all the instruments do you own, do you have, like, would you say professional grade stuff or do you have enough to, you know, get yourself by for whatever you need the job for or what you're going for, uh, especially especially in a lot of your covers? Yeah, um, my horns, my trum, my trombone is professional. It, well, it's an intermediate trombone. Uh, I got it for college, so and I have two trombones now. The other one is definitely not professional, but it works when I need to play some lead trombone, like jazz stuff. It's a really small horn, so it works for that. Um, my trumpet is, it. I bought it off of my friend, and when I took it to the store recently, the person at the store is a trumpet player, and he said it's a really nice horn. Um, it's a Besson from like the eighties or seventies and, and, um, it's just like a jazz horn or something like that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't have much to say about it, but he said it's a really nice horn. He said, take care of it. They don't make them like that anymore. Apparently some of the valves are like facing ways that horns don't anymore. Interesting. Uh, so if you like it like that for whatever reason, I can't tell the difference cause I don't play trumpet like that. Um, but I like the way it feels though. So maybe, maybe I do like it. I don't know. Um, but other than that, like my guitar is fine. My my bass actually is a really nice bass. I just got a new bass because I got endorsed by Reverend. Um, so I got that bass. And um, other than that, none of my instruments are nowhere near an intermediate or professional grade, which is not many other instruments. But but yeah, it's a lot to keep up with. I uh, I was talking to Carlos about it too from Insane in the Rain. Where like, you know, he just got a trumpet and the trumpet's not great, but his whole thing is like, you know, it, it matters more about the player than it does the instrument, you know, like you can be a phenomenal player and get a $200 instrument, or you can be someone who's never played before and play on a $10,000 instrument. I'm sure the phenomenal player will sound better on the cheaper instrument, you know, like it's like watching those YouTube videos. That's like, I just played my $10,000 sax and my $200 sax. I want to tell you the difference. And yeah, it's like, right. Yeah, you can hear the difference, but like the quality of both of them is still phenomenal because the person playing is like phenomenal or they both suck because the person playing sucks and just has a YouTube channel. I don't know. <laughs> but like, <laughs> yeah, I feel that man. It, it is totally regardless of the quality of the instrument the player versus uh the instrument unless if the instrument is just like you know unable to perform i've had cheap snare drums for a long time but you know oh, it's yeah. like it comes to a point in time where the instrument really can't live up to your standards or vice versa where true. it's like if you're if you're playing too expensive of an instrument yet you're not getting your stuff together then you know it's like why why do you even consider having that it's 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 really fascinating though but i bet if anything playing all those instruments give you a whole new perspective on like your approach of just trombone it gives you uh i bet it just gives you a whole bunch of insight for all the stuff that you do nowadays i, I bet th what's one thing you take away from like being able to play all these different instruments now uh w just in general yeah i definitely take away how I see music, I guess. I don't even, this is such a weird question, uh, just in general, because I feel like, I feel like my answer is like how I see music, but like in my head, I'm always kind of picturing things on a piano, like how it looks on a piano roll. Like when I play a B flat, like scale on trombone, I'm picturing like, okay, so how does that B flat scale sound on like piano? Like I see it. Cause like, if I can see a keyboard in front of me, I can visualize like chords changing. I can visualize everything. So the more that I pick up more instruments and the more that I get these patterns down, the stronger the connection gets of like, of me relating everything back to a keyboard or back to a piano roll. Um, like when I started learning saxophone and started learning like two, five ones, like I would just mess around and learn two, five, one licks on saxophone and all the keys. Mm -hmm. And whenever I go back to trombone, it's like my understanding of all of that gets stronger on trombone. Same thing goes for like bass or even guitar. So it's not even like a wind instrument thing. It's just, the more that I'm learning these patterns, the more it gets under my fingers. And the, the I guess the better the connections in my brain get, like they just get a lot tighter. My overall understanding on, on how to navigate the, the realm or the realm, the range of these instruments in general get, if that makes sense. I don't know if that even makes sense outside of my head or not. I think, I think it does because, you know, if you play, if you're a musician that plays multiple instruments, 
you know, it's going to give you a better understanding of your roots of your primary instrument uh, along those lines. Like for me, you know, I play a little bit of piano too outside of drums. My mentor, Victor Lewis, was like, you know, the more piano you play, the better drummer you're going to be because if anything, you're starting to understand more qualities about music in general as as a whole versus just your individual instrument versus just like, you know, what you can get just solely out of, you know, playing notes or playing a lick along those lines. You understand the context behind that and understanding other people's roles hopefully gives you a better perspective on just like thinking out loud of like, how do I see fit in this scenario? So you have a better sense of the bigger picture. At least that's like the way I try to think about things. You know, I would personally probably sh- would like to try to learn how to play an or- a horn instrument one of these days. Cause I, I've never had the chance to do that. I tried actually playing trumpet when I was growing up in like, you know, fourth or fifth grade. The three instruments I tried was trumpet, violin, and percussion. But I was already taking lessons before I even got introduced to playing uh, any instruments in intermediate school. Uh, so I bet, you know, along those lines, it made sense to me where it's like the more tenor sax you play, the better trombone you'll get to understand because you'll take things that you learn. Like, you know, if you're transcribing, let's say John Coltrane, for example, you find a lick that you want to learn from John Coltrane, you can transcribe that and learn that onto your trombone and then utilize that for your, for the rest of your kind of playing or something like that, at least, at least in my eyes. So dude. Yeah. And like, there's also like, common ground between all instruments regardless what you're playing too like especially with whenever i have an issue on saxophone i always just think about back to like my basics of playing brass which is like you're probably just not using correct air and that's probably the only thing you need to fix and then that is what fixes a lot of my problems on sax so if anything being frustrated on playing something easy on another instrument just makes me think more about my fundamentals, which overall, like, you know, fundamentals on all wind instruments, brass or or woodwind, is the same thing. Just have consistent air leaving your diaphragm or leaving your lungs out through the instrument, and most of your issues will go away. Now, what consistent air means is a whole talk that can be had for an hour. Right. <laughs> That's, like, the hard thing is understanding what consistency means. Like, is that the volume of air leaving your body is that the speed of the air leaving the body and like there's a whole lot of ideas of what people think that is but focusing on the fundamentals in general and even like playing like a string instrument like yeah you don't really have to breathe to play a string instrument for any other reason but to stay alive but sometimes just like playing a lick on guitar and like taking a deep breath in and pacing my air out while playing like guitar helps it helps me especially when i'm tracking a recording or like Breathing in time with the metronome sometimes helps me play more in time on guitar. Some I don't know what the psychology is, but like, it works. It does. I I, I totally agree with that, man. Why not we uh, take this point in time to get some questions from chat and for anybody watching the live stream at the current moment in time, uh, because I bet some of you guys have some things you'd like to ask uh, Jeremy, some things you guys like to ask me, um, and we'll and we'll kind of get to that. If you guys can go to my Discord page. And if you join our Discord, uh, there's a section that says Ask Dom Palumbi. Uh, you type your question there. You could type it in chat, but the easiest way is to get it in Discord. That way I can kind of uh, keep track of all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. I also have the, the, the Discord up as well. Awesome. <laughs> Jeremy, waffles or oh, pancakes? Yeah. I guess that's that's the first question already that I see in chat. Waffles or pancakes? <laughs> You know what? So I used to work at Waffle House. Um, ah, that's cool. That was my first job. And Waffle House is a chaotic place. I love the energy, but also I think no one should ever go there for their own safety. And at the moments you think you understand how disgusting it is, you really don't. But um, I, I, used, I used to be a heavy pancake person. I think as of right now, I lean a little more towards pancakes. But Waffle House truly showed me that if you have a good Waffle then a waffle can blow a pancake out of the water. But if the mix sucks or the iron sucks, yo, waffles can get real disgusting really fast. Bruh, I, I, I actually have never really, like, growing up as a kid, I never really got into waffles or pancakes too much, to be honest. The first, like, legitimate waffle I tried was actually when I was on tour with the Rutgers Glee Club. It was a men's chorus. We went on a, a, a two-week European tour. I think we were somewhere in uh in the netherlands and i actually had a like a sugar 
sugar powered waffle and it was like amazing uh and then oh yeah and then from there on out you know i'm i'm not even sure because it's like those are two things i don't eat too much uh along those lines quote unquote maybe you know they're, they're not really necessarily good for you per se but right. i i guess like that i think about it i'd actually go for a waffle over a pancake any day but you know i won't i won't say no to a, a chocolate chip pancake if i had to you know it, that's oh, yeah. interesting. I didn't know you worked at a Waffle House, man. That's 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 something I didn't know. <laughs> that, was, that was my first first job ever. It was good money. I made I literally made like forty thousand a year. Bruh, working, <laughs> working at a Waffle House, <laughs> dang. It's a server. I mean, hey, man, kudos to you on that. That's that's great. See, it goes to show, you know, sometimes you get a, a, a any kind of job that maybe you wouldn't suspect yourself to work but you can you know really kickstart things from just you know being financially in a great spot too so you know yeah that, that job bought this laptop it bought everything i used to start scott network so had i not had that job i probably would not be having any of the gear that i needed to get this going heck yeah dude uh so our first question we got on discord uh question for scott tune what was the breakout video slash song that really brought attention to your channel Oh, that one. That one was the me channel video. So I had a few videos go viral on Facebook and like just viral in general. Like some videos that gave me a couple thousand followers or subscribers. But the me channel video I did, which I mean, that's like one of the biggest memes of like all time, like meme songs. Right. Um, also, it's just a great song, like memes aside. It's just a banger. But I did that cover. And I, the reason why I did that cover that's actually really funny is because my job at the time I was working at a place called called metro diner they were cutting my hours to the point where i barely had enough for rent so i was like well if i have two days off that i normally would not have off so let me like work more on ska covers and the first cover i did was that me channel video and i woke up the next day and it was at like a hundred thousand views on youtube which mm -hmm. like now is like looking back it's like not like a lot compared to like the views i have now but for like a youtuber with like ten thousand subscribers that was like a huge thing that's like a lot a lot and then people were writing like articles about it and then i gained twenty thousand subscribers that day and then the next yeah the, i think by the time it stopped trending i was at forty thousand subscribers which is like you know for it falling to grow four times the size it was before it was pretty pretty dope so dude that, that was that was the video that must have been a like such an exhilarating uh feel too where it's just like all of a sudden either if your phone or you know your computer or your email just starts blowing up you get a crap ton of notifications uh i bet i bet it was kind of a wild ride once you woke up the next morning and you were just like wait what <laughs> uh along yeah. those along those lines because i can imagine like you know for me especially not having uh really a, a big social media following either you know something like that doesn't really happen and it goes to show that like you started from relatively ground zero if if uh, if i could say but it, you know, the peaks and valleys are, are, are what's the the biggest part of how you managed to grow yourself to that point too. Not only just being you know, like the me the me saw me channel being a, a meme song, but it's all. I also agree. There's a lot of great meme songs that were bangers, just gr straight up songs before you know the internet happened, <laughs> oh, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But that's that's fascinating. I do remember watching that video. I bet I didn't I didn't recognize that was your first one per se. Um, Blazon's asking, is there a genre of music that you're not familiar with, but you want to learn more about? Ooh, um, as far as just like production wise, uh, pretty much all EDM, <laughs> especially like drum and bass type EDM. That's a genre just like in general, I have not listened to that much. I definitely always enjoy it. And I think like that realm of EDM, that's like the very chaotic drums and stuff like that. And like very technical I feel like there's a lot of crossover that could be really cool, especially with like mathy prog rock yeah. type stuff. That's something I would love to do, but I, I don't even know how to even begin to attempt to produce that in programs. Like I'm just learning how to how to shape sound waves and synths into like whatever I want. I'm starting to finally learn what all of that means. I think let alone creating a whole like EDM yeah. song. Yeah. No, yeah, I think the EDM world is is so like it's been around for a bit, but I feel like there's still so much untapped potential. Now, of course, maybe it's me not knowing so much about it either. Whereas, like, I actually used to do a duo project with a friend of mine where we were doing, like, pretty much live drum and bass cover. Or not really covers, but we were doing, like, a lot of experimental 
drums and keys, drum and bass kind of stuff. Uh, and I, I was doing that for a while, and it was always something that fascinated me, at least like with regards to like Jojo Mayer's Nerve or you know Mark Giuliano's beat music. Those are like two examples of, of bands that I know that are you know really breaking the electronic music scene uh, in general. Mm-hmm. So like you know I'd be curious to know to see what other directions ha- other artists have taken. In it may be interesting to see like you know you go in a in a in do a ska cover of an EDM tune or something just to see mm-hmm. how those worlds kind of blend because you know you don't you don't know if it's gonna work or something. Will it blend EDM and ska music? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going AWOL with the jokes today. It's it's uh <laughs> Father's Day just happened, so it's just like my dad's my dad's rubbing off on me quite a bit. <laughs> um Gohan is asking, hardest song you had to make a ska cover for? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. The uh, the Megalovania is definitely a top contender for that one. That, that song took me two weeks to cover. That was a long one. But um, another cover that was hard to do was I did One Summer's Day, which is the opening song from Spirited Away, the Miyazaki film. And doing that was, so that was my first time ever taking an orchestral song in any facet and doing a cover of it. But not only that, but the chords in that song aren't real chords. Like the first chord is an F, a B, and an E. So you could look at it as like an F13 chord you can also look at it as like a B11 chord type thing. I forgot the exact chords, but it's something like that. Like they just look like chords with a bunch of extensions. But when you play those chords in context, it just doesn't sound right. Hmm. So I basically have to revoice the entire the, the entire song into, and I just did two five ones for like all of it, and it worked. So I was like, okay, cool. The melody can follow two five ones, but like, <laughs> but it's for the longest time I was sitting down, like, how can I make this work? Because like each chord is like either the interval is like a tritone and a fourth. That's like the whole song. So it's like wow. those aren't those aren't real chords. There's no third. There's no fifth. How do I how do I make this into a, a playable cover? And I had to revoice it all. But once I once I did that, oh, and it had violin too. My friend was playing violin on that cover. So that was like a voice I was not used to writing. I was like, how do I mix this in? Violin sits at the same frequency as trumpet and guitar. So like mixing that in is a challenge. Mm-hmm. And Yes, so that was a that was a hard cover to pull off, but it sounds great. It's one of my favorite covers ever. I'm even just trying to think about that chord in general, like a tritone and a fourth. I don't even know if there's a quality that you could give that because it doesn't really have like an augmented kind of uh, augmented or diminished kind of sound. Usually, the tritone yeah. you find in a dominant chord, so it's like really interesting that like that was like the trickiest thing or or however the i'll have to check out that that cover just to see like or or the uh, the original to kind of hear the context of that chord because that's like i i I know people use tritone substitutions for you know all sorts of regular jazz stuff but you know that's that's fascinating to me where they just take a specific sound and and they're manipulating as much with that so and those interesting constraints sometimes can be challenging too because you know it's not necessarily going to be the easiest for you to work around with um yeah that's super cool uh double duck is asking what is your favorite anime song we need dom to play it later today because i'm going to be playing requests after the uh after the podcast oh that's so funny favorite anime song um ooh, i feel like it's a oh, i feel like it's a stock answer very stock but tank is always a banger classic to be honest, you know, as somebody that doesn't watch too much anime or little to any at all, uh, I've always I have had uh, that as definitely a high appreciation for just the quality of music. And it goes to show like anime music sometimes is, is really some of the dopest stuff ever, especially with just cowboy oh, yeah. cowboy bebop being being all that whole show apparently is like a whole jazz fusion album. Or, or oh absolutely it's like, I'm, I'm so upset it's not on spotify it would i would listen to it every day if it was i'm actually going to take back tank and replace it with another song from that show uh new york rush that Ooh. song it, it's it's i think from what i've been told i'm not sure i can't find the, the 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 information on this but i remember once seeing it's stanley clark on bass it's um it's like a powerhouse lineup of like jazz musicians from like the last like 25 years playing on that song i can't remember who the trumpet player was um but i can't find that information anymore 
But yeah, it's like a jazz combo version of the song Rush, which is also off of that soundtrack. But that one's like a big band. And then there's like the New York Rush, which is like a New York combo sound. It's so good, though. It's it's a dope song. There's like a part where it's like a trumpet solo and it's just trumpet and drums. And, yo, they're having a fucking conversation and it's yeah, heated yeah. and it's so good. Yeah. I wouldn't even be surprised if it was like Maynard Ferguson or something like that. Because I, I think from listening to Tank so much, it can't, it seems like it's coming from the big band era with like you know maynard ferguson and, and his oh, and his yeah. big band at the time or uh i'm trying to think whether it's like arturo sandoval or um i'm just trying to think of like other big name trumpet players that were just like ripping it back in the day uh in that yeah. sense too um so that's that is really really funny fred ling is at, fred link is asking favorite meme song oh geez favorite um, meme song since we're on the internet. <laughs> is my favorite theme theme song. That song before it became a meme, I used to just play it because it was just so good. That or the shopping channel. Or the we sh- we shopping channel. Yeah, that one. That's like a bossa. It's it, it it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> do you know um? Do you know Pepsi Man, by any chance, or know of it? No, I. I'll have to probably play that on stream later, but there's a, my friends uh, introduced me to it. Apparently, it's actually an old classic video game, and I didn't even know it existed. Uh, but it's it's got a kind of a drum and bass kind of thing. It looks like it's it's its own anime, uh, if you will. That's that's been a funny one. Um, I'm trying to think what other ones have been my favorite. Um, even a that's that so funny because that song I used to like, like before it became a meme. That was another song I used to listen to. I had it like on my iPod in high school. Shooting Star, then, I want to like, say. I don't, I don't remember the uh, title. It, I know the, I think the band is Capital Cities because like I used to listen to Capital Cities. I oh, think, it is Shooting is it Star. Okay. Oh, no, I'm thinking of Safe and Sound. That's a that that Shooting Star is another song, but I'm thinking of Safe and Sound. That I used to listen to for a year because that record came out, yeah, 2013. And then it became a meme in like 2016. And I was like, why is Safe and Sound suddenly everywhere? Like, wow, what a what a time. What I know, what a time to be alive and what a time for music to 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 transform into some of the most <laughs> jokester stuff on the interwebs, man. It, it's it it brings me back to even just like YouTube in general. When you watch with you when you would watch YouTube for funny videos before they classified them as memes, I think that's like one of the biggest things. Uh, I I look back to it like Picnic Face, for example, like was mm-hmm. was one of those YouTube channels where they were just making funny content or funny videos, uh, and mm-hmm. you know the the term meme uh, didn't even like come out of that uh until i don't even know how many years i would like I, I would probably say at least 10 years after like in the 2010s maybe i could be wrong um but hey yeah memes are memes now uh kirk is asking us uh who would you like to collab with the most dead or alive so regardless of whether Ooh. they exist on the earth or at this moment in time Ooh, that is a that's it. there's like oh that that's like there's so many people i would love to collab with mm-hmm. um i would just love to collab with a lot of musicians that i don't even know just like musicians that i love that make great music like if i could like play a, a tune and have to like woody shaw come and play trumpet on it that'd be pretty sick Bruh. or like any of those old jazz cats like, i've been listening to a lot of jazz lately so like like having like anyone like like Wallace Rooney or Joe Henderson, any of those jazz players come and just shred a solo because there's a lot of ties with jazz music into early ska, especially. I actually just found out recently there's a ska band. They were the first ska band ever. They're out of Jamaica called the Scottalites. And you know, all of the original music is a lot of like jazz songs, just them performing like ska versions of them. And there's one record they have called High Bop Ska. And I didn't know this for the longest time. I always thought the musicianship, I'm like, this is like really good and underrated. Turns out that like Charles Mingus's band was the band playing with the Scottalites on that. So when you're hearing these solos shredding, it's like, yo, these are like players that play with Charles Mingus. And I didn't know that like the Scottalites had had them on there like wow, that. So that's cool. 
Yeah, and, and there's like the New York Ska Jazz Ensemble, which is members of the Scottalites who formed like a Ska Jazz band. And, you know, like they, the same thing, they've had like notable jazz musicians playing with them as well. So that's like really cool. So I feel like the room for like jazz and ska, the mix of it is so like, that's another mix that there's so much potential for, but like not many jazz musicians dive into the world of ska. And the ones who do, they're like pushing the limits. Like the New York Ska Jazz Ensemble is very, very good. And like not a lot of people check them out, obviously, but but I feel like just seeing jazz musicians in general come and shred in ska would be a dope thing. So yeah, I guess I'm, I guess I'll end it there. It's like, if I, if I could pull anybody, I was like, yeah, I'm going to like pull any, any of the jazz people or Christian Scott, the trumpet player, the contemporary trumpet player. Yep. Christian Scott. So good. Yeah. Probably Christian Scott. That's my final answer. I would, I would love to play with Christian Scott one of these days. I know, I know for him, like I always loved his version of so what with Thomas Pridgen off of, I forget what album it was. Um, but it was like the most killing, like funk halftime backbeat to, to the classic Miles Davis tune, or, um, even just thinking back to play with like Clifford Brown or Louis Armstrong, even just like to kind of have those, those greats to kind of like feel the time that they were feeling, or just like to experience how they embodied the music and how much soul they have behind the whole art form because like anybody that kind of goes along with this tradition it's important to recognize that they fully invest themselves into it not just like you know play the music and then call it a night no they 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 yeah. they speak it in in life they, they they you know talk about it all the time they make it a part of who they are um so get it to get a moment even just to like hang with some of those greats uh i think are even you know bigger things that some of us maybe wish we got to experience because then you know on top of that that would inspire us more on how we you know curate our own vision on playing things carry on the traditions of those that came before us like we were talking about before and stuff like that um you know it's it's fascinating but i also you know like to collaborate with anybody that inspires me and stuff like that i've gotten the the chance to collaborate with jeremy a few times and this dude inspires me a heck ton man you know, you guys, you guys should see. We did a we did a video for my Instagram Jam series of a, of Herbie Hancock's classic Chameleon. It was only like a minute long, but it's like really, really neat. And you know, just to make make music with with somebody that I don't regularly get to play music with all the time, it's always a nice uh, little thing. So, Sketch is asking favorite punk and or ska bands to recommend so maybe like if somebody's getting into ska music for the first time or punk music for the first time who are some uh cats you recommend checking out uh for people that want to like explore more into this very niche scene yeah so for ska music the way i i when i suggest ska bands i just go ahead and skip the big ones everyone knows because literally if you search for ska music you're going to hear like less than Jake. You're going to hear Shirley Manifesto. You're going to hear all of these big bands that, that everyone talks about. So I just go straight for like more stuff that's closer to the roots. So I would say like the Scottalites, uh, Desmond Decker, um, who are uh, like yeah, Scottalites, Desmond Decker, like Prince Buster, stuff like that. That's like really roots. Second wave, I would say like the specials, which is a pretty well-known band, but always throw them out there the selector like i said new york ska jazz ensemble i also uh check out the tokyo ska paradise orchestra i will argue with anyone about this they are the best ska band to ever exist um because they're all like ridiculously trained jazz musicians playing ska but they manage to do like from like the traditional ska sounds like the ska punk sound and everything in between they also just randomly mix together like i don't know like j-pop and like salsa into their music like do whatever they want they just do whatever they want and everything they do works really well and sometimes they'll just pull on like random guest musicians of any caliber and it just works and i think they really carry the the spirit of ska the best out of any band so tokyo ska paradise orchestra is definitely definitely a band i recommend out of any ska band as far as like punk bands go definitely oh for this also uh, transitions over from ska with punk Uh, Fishbone. That's a band I've been listening to a lot recently. Uh, They are a band that people know pretty well because they were like doing a lot in the 80s. They're a band that kind of came a little too early, I think, if they had come like 
come around five, ten years later, mm -hmm. they would have popped off a lot more. They did a lot of ska music, but they also mixed together a lot of like new wave, and they had like some punk and like funk metal. They they're also a band that just they they didn't care. They just did what they did, and everything they did slapped. And they were a band that I, I had to listen to for a while because at first I was like, they're making music, but some of it's not ska. This is weird. But as I start listening to them more, I'm like, oh wait, no, it's okay that it's weird. Like. You know, when I was when I was sixteen, and all I wanted was ska. I like dismissed a lot of it, but now that I'm like older and like my musical horizon is bigger, I'm listening a lot more to Fishbone, and I'm like, wow, this band was doing so many cool things and like really pushing the boundaries on like John genre conforming, I guess. And had they been around doing what they're doing now, probably they would probably be popping off right now a lot more. But they're still like a lot of people consider them legendary status, so. It's another band that doesn't get enough love. Dope. I, I I know for me, I haven't heard a lot of these bands, so I'm going to be definitely checking some of this stuff out uh, when it comes down to it. Any final thoughts that you got there, Germ? Any 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 things coming up for you in the in the next couple months, or or things that you want to share with us along those lines, where we can find you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you just find me all over. I pretty much post as everything especially to twitter because i'm just bad at keeping secrets and surprises so i typically update twitter and instagram with everything that i'm doing along the way i have some things that i'm working on that will be surprises i'm trying my best not to like leak the information at all like i just oh my gosh uh yeah i have some cool things coming out hopefully a month from now all of the cool things that i'm working on will be out and ready for the world also um i'm gonna be getting back on twitch soon i had to take my computer to get fixed it crashed and the internet's been cutting off on it which is annoying but it's been doing it less it's like it did it we were testing the call the other day yep and it did that it cut out like a few times so uh, i have to figure out what's going on with that and but once that's good i'm gonna start streaming again i've just been writing a lot of music so a lot of live streaming of me writing music and yeah that's pretty much all i have to say thanks for having me and thanks for everyone who's been watching Heck yeah. Chat, if you guys don't know this guy, make sure you go f give him a sub on YouTube. Follow him on his Twitch page. Uh, I, I would, don't be surprised if I end up helping this this guy out with some of his Twitch stuff because I like to help out my friends uh, on this platform. But this guy, I believe, is one of the hardest working dudes I know with when it comes to social media stuff. So he's posting stuff all the time. Uh, and Jeremy, it's a real pleasure to have you here, man. I really want to say thank you for taking some time to hang out with us today. Yeah, you got gifted a sub, by the way, on my stream. So <laughs> welcome back to oh. the sub clan, my man. And uh, for anybody oh. anybody watching the uh, YouTube video, thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the Domcast series. You can find all the links in the description to find more about Jeremy and Scott 2 Network and all the stuff down below. And we'll catch you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. And yeah, cut. <laughs> All right, chat. You you can act, you, chat can act normal now. We're we're good. We're done with the shtick, chat. Now now comes the real real interview. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you guys for all the follows and for the support uh, in, in between the stream. Usually when I'm uh, having this podcast kind of thing happening, I'm muting alerts to make sure nothing goes astray or nothing goes crazy. So much appreciated. But yeah, go go follow this man, chat. Make sure make sure you go follow this man. Do, do, do it because I told you to. Do this one because I told you to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey man, it's good to have you here. Uh I think we should totally I should totally try to play one of your covers uh or something to 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 kind of kick off the requests for me cuz Technically, I don't. I I don't want to say I don't need you anymore, but uh, you you are free to go, uh, if you if you would please. Um, uh, but hey, man, it's really been a pleasure to get to chat with you for a little bit and talk a bunch of stuff, and, and do all sorts of kinds of stuff, man. It's good to get and 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 picking your brain too. I learned quite a few things already from from our a little under two hour conversation, man. It's been fun. So. Yeah, thanks for having me again. This was so much fun. Dude, yeah, man. Maybe maybe we'll get you in on a future Domcast episode and, and touch base and see how things have progressed uh, down the lines, depending on how long I can I, I plan on continuing this. So we'll we'll figure that out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, hey. yeah. So, 
All right. Well, I'll let you go. Appreciate you being here, man. And Chad, go follow this man once again. Make sure you make sure you go do so. Uh, we'll hopefully see him on Twitch coming up soon. Jeremy, thanks again, buddy. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah.